Hey guys, so I was reading this interview in this magazine. Actually, it's not a magazine, it's a weekly journal uh, publication by one of the best um, independent journalistic outlets in the United States. Um, even if you're not Christian, it's, it's, you know, only ha it only has a few items that relate directly to Christianity, such as a, a prayer in the end and so on. But if you're looking for good journalism, uh, this is it. This is one of the best ones in the, in the United States. Um, you know, actually, it's really interesting. This religion uh, was founded by a woman. You know, quite some time ago. So, in any case, let's um, let's talk about this one. And, and you'll, you'll notice a Native American or a First Nations person on the cover. If you haven't already, there's a Canadian film called Real. Na uh, let's see. I think it's called Real Injun, with real spelled uh, just like a movie clip. Uh, R E E L. And it's a documentary. It's really good. If you haven't seen it, I suggest watching it. Um, but in this particular. Um, publication which was on December 20th, 2021, there's an, in there's an interview with the GOP chair, the Republican chair called uh, Lana McDaniel. I've never heard of her before, but she's uh, obviously powerful and she's from Michigan. And you know what she talks about, obviously she talks about Trump. And you know she basically says that, you know, you've got a situation where you cannot, you, you cannot disavow Donald Trump because he's just so popular. And let me see if I can, here we go. It's the very first sentence by Linda Feldman. And it says, when it comes to former president Donald Trump, Lana McDaniel is adamant about one thing. If he left the party, Republicans would lose. So why is that the case? And I don't think the answer is complicated. Um, you know, this, that GOP chair is uh, related to Mitt Romney, which shows you just how incestuous the world of politics has become just like probably <laughs> a lot of other things in society in the united states because we're a developed country and that's always been a problem with a developed country is trying to expand and grow in new ways even as property interests and uh, property interests consolidate in the hands of fewer people um, sometimes taxes will go up and you know thereby solidifying the power structure and making it harder for new ideas and new people to come in. And that, that issue, new people, is why Donald Trump, and in part the, the GOP, has remained popular, despite quote unquote controversial comments. And it's interesting because this immigration issue has been a, on the forefront for decades. But if you go back and look at the debates between, in the GOP between Ronald Reagan and George Bush, the first one, you'll see that there was no animus whatsoever <clears throat> against immigrants, even illegal immigrants. George Bush, a former CIA director, the first one, he actually mentioned, he was asked whether or not the children of, of illegal immigrants within the United States uh, should be allowed into schools and should be able to receive school instruction in the same classrooms as <clears throat> native-born Americans or as people that would presumably have a definite right to be there. And if you look at the video, uh, the, the elder Bush thought about it, actually, and, you know, said, yeah, you know, if they're in the country, you know, these, you know they've got a right to be there. And you can see how intuition has changed. And the question is, why has that changed? <clears throat> and to me, the, one of the reasons it's changed is because progressives have failed to take hold of the immigration issue in a way that's balanced. Now, and it's surprising because it's not that complicated. <clears throat> if, if you're looking at the debates and you'll notice this is very, very, you know, prominent in GOP thinking now is to associate illegal immigrants with crime and using that as a method or a conduit for increasing border security, ICE, funding those institutions, uh, more giving jobs, to quote unquote working class people or people without college degrees, presumably. And you know, you have this whole job structure that's tied into the military industrial complex because a security based argument, which is always based on fear, will almost always succeed in the face of logic. And so the only way to beat those arguments <clears throat> is to acknowledge that the other side is, is fundamentally correct. <clears throat> and what's surprising is how none of the progressive politicians or speakers are able to make a counter-argument that is emotionally appealing while also considering or being empathetic 
to the opposition's legitimate concerns. And again, to me, it's not that hard. When you talk about immigration, whether legal or illegal, you have to ask yourself, do we want an entire United States or an entire any country that looks the same or that looks like a small town in Iowa? And keep in mind, there's nothing wrong with Iowa. In fact, the way that the system is set up based on when the primaries take place and where, Iowans in a small state that's almost completely homogenous racially, not ideologically, they pretty much choose the president because the primaries take place in Iowa first. And if you don't have momentum there, you're not going to have the financial backers that get you through you no know, more primaries. <clears throat> and so Iowa has always enjoyed an, outs an outsized, outsized influence within the political process. And if you're a cynic, you're gonna say that's because it's a homogenous state. That's one way the status quo maintains power and so on and so forth. But it's also because for the most part, you know, because Iowans are in the middle of the country, they're also a good litmus test for what opinions and viewpoints and information are they receiving, given that they are, they are semi-isolated from the rest of the country and the rest of the world, being smack dab in the middle of the United States, which is a country geographically, you know, not as connected to the rest of the world as, say, you know, Germany, or, you know, or say, Switzerland, or, you know, Turkey, and so on and so forth, um, or Singapore, et cetera. And so you, again, have to look at this with that perspective. Number one, there's nothing wrong with a country that looks like Iowa. But number two, it doesn't represent progress. Progress means reversing segregation, especially racial segregation, especially in the United States, that has harmed social cohesion and productivity and talent for generations. In fact, since the beginning of the country's inception, that's redundant, but since the country's inception. And we have to acknowledge that, or, or, and if we don't, we're just ignoring history. But we have to acknowledge that this country has been based on, well, first of all, it has been based on the work of immigrants, whether from Africa or from Asia or otherwise, but it's, that's not unique to the United States. Uh, what was unique was the method um, by which the work was attained, um, and the cruelty with which some of the laborers, particularly from the continent of Africa, were treated to the point where we call them African Americans in this country because they are one of the few people, groups in the whole world, that don't know where they came from, that don't know the country they came from, whereas you would never call yourself, if you're in the United States, a, you know, European American, uh, you would call yourself a German American or an Italian American and so on. And so you, when you look at that history, you can, if you're Bill Bryson, a very good author, say there's, you know, when I grew up in Iowa, it was lovely, it was one of the best times of my life. But in order for Bill Bryson to say that, he has to, in a sense, be divorced or segregated from a lot of the issues, not only in his country, but overseas. And so you end up in a situation where Bill Bryson has an opinion that's based in part on being in a bubble that's segregated from the rest of the world and his own country. And the reason that's a problem is because number one, it doesn't give you accurate information. Accurate information or reliable intelligence is based on all the data, not just a, a few data points that are within your own reach, particularly when that reach is purely local in a way that may represent a lot of the country, but certainly does not represent a lot of that information. And number two, when somebody typically from a purely localized bubble encounters a diverse bubble, they typically leave. And that's true within the country. And that's true in Bill Bryson's case where he left Iowa, a, a place that he loves, and moved to the UK, which has been extremely, has become extremely diverse over time, during his lifetime, certainly. So you see number, a couple of things here. It's about the talent. And so when you talk about talent, you have to talk about immigration because there's no question that you cannot attract talent unless you are, unless you have the image, and some would say the mirage of being open to diversity. But what's happened in this country is the progressives have gone overboard. They've 
said, and I'm guilty of the same thing, they've essentially put, a, put together an argument that says that we have a developed nation, a lot of the, a lot of the people in this, in this country who have government jobs or who have some other type of legacy preference or inside information are, in some cases, inferior in work ethic and innovation than native-born Americans. And I've cited this myself. I've, I've cited the number, the percentage of, of people who have founded companies, particularly technology companies, and as evidence that immigrants are a vital link to innovation. And it's not just in technology. Gosh, look at, just, just go around and just look around and, and look at the, what, we, we, what we would be missing to the extent that we did not have immigration. And that's what people are missing. If you go to Iowa, there's innovation, just not the kind that allows us to maximize our potential because when you fundamentally think about it, talent is not distributed equally, but it's not distributed in one race. That's something we can all agree on. And once you acknowledge that, if you consider the endpoint of the immigration debate to be a place like Iowa as an ideal destination at the end of the journey, you're missing out on at least half, well, about 80% actually, of the world's talent. Think about that for a second. Not just in athletics, but just in everything. If you want to attract talent, whether it's an Einstein or a, a, a Hungarian scientist that you're trying to recruit for World War II and the Manhattan Project, if you, if you have these things, you have to have the image of diversity, even if it's a mirage, even if your country is filthy with segregation and historical segregation, whether in fact or by law. And what we don't understand when we discuss immigration is that laws do not cause assimilation. Communities cause assimilation. And the reason some communities are more apt to favor immigration than others doesn't really have to do with illegal versus legal. It has to do with the idea that they are losing out on something that would otherwise, whether it's government funding or something else like a job, that justifiably belongs to them. Not because of birth, but because of merit. In other words, the nature of being an American born in this country compared to somebody who, say, doesn't speak English very well, just on a basic factual analysis, a native-born American should be more qualified for that job if all the laws are enforced. Once you go off the books, you start working for cash, it becomes fairly obvious why some people believe that or substitute immigration as a proxy, or they view immigration, particularly illegal immigration, as a proxy for an unfair playing field. And that has to be acknowledged. And when you're having these debates, remember that you have to acknowledge that, that diversity in this country is a mirage. And other travel authors, not just Bill Bryson, have discussed this, that America is not really a country of diversity. It's a country that tolerates people. We tolerate you. We don't really like diversity, especially when it gets up too close but we tolerate it, which quite frankly, given the segregation involved historically is the only logical outcome. And when liberals and progressives talk about immigration in a way that maligns the other side, they're going to lose because all Donald Trump has to tell you or respond or say to anyone who claims that immigration is a net positive, all you have to do is point out one name of a victim that was shot and killed or murdered by an illegal immigrant. And the response to that should be, well, that's a police problem. That's a law enforcement efficacy and competence problem. And if you, if you have to look at it, if you want to be fair, as not just an issue of illegal immigration and crime, you have to look at it in the sense that You've got a police department that's, that's typically, that typically receives a substantial amount of taxpayer revenue in order to 
combat crime? What is the issue in terms of catching criminals to the extent that we have a police force that's specifically charged with this task? And that's where you see the GOP becoming reflexively pro-police, militantly so, because what they're going to respond, what they're going to say is, see, if you just take the gloves off, this is an age-old debate, we can solve the crimes or at least reduce them. And you can see how this has a lot of appeal, especially now with surveillance technology having been almost perfected. You can see the appeal of this argument. And it's always had an appeal because of its fear-based foundation. So I can talk or shout from the rooftops all I want about how positive immigration is, but all Donald Trump has to do to beat me in that debate is simply cite a few names of homicide victims. And the response to that is, you know, that's, you're absolutely correct. Where were the police and how do we help the police in that specific instance get the powers they need under the constitutions, guarantee of checks and balances and due process and privacy, believe it or not, to do, how do we help the police since in, in most cases they're already being funded substantially from city coffers? How do we get the police involved so that they become a trusted partner and can solve these crimes or at least deter them? That should be the debate. So you take the attention immediately away from the outliers, the illegal immigrants, because Ill illegal immigrant, immigration has always been with us. I explained that from the get-go. Um, illegal labor has always been with us I, all over the world. I explained that from the get-go. And this country was built in part by illegal labor. People looking for a better life and probably being lied to in their country of birth as they were searching for better job opportunities overseas. Still happens today. Not much has changed, that's part of the problem. So Donald Trump says that you, you all you have to do is shift the debate into, you know, I, that's a tragedy. It, I'm, it should have never happened. How do we help the police in this specific instance? Or what we, could we have done to help the police in this specific instance? And the response will probably be, well, let's close the borders. And again, you see the GOP's intuitive appeal. They're very logical. Close the borders, okay? Has that ever worked? And what would be the cost of patrolling a border as large as the United States over the next 50 years, as opposed to attempting to use that money on social welfare or on something else? And in other words, how do we find a balance? And quite particularly a balance that involves, given just the massive amount of land and desert and, and just the manpower that, or just the government power that would be required to patrol the entire border between Mexico and the United States, what do you think the cost would be over the next 10 years? So, okay, you, you try to get those numbers because they're going to be gargantuan. And we already tried that, right? And, and whatever the number Trump comes back with, you can respond with, well, you did actually increase ICE funding and ICE employment substantially. You made a lot of arrests. This has been documented all over the place. And yet we still have those instances of, of crime by illegal immigrants. So clearly something is not working. And what do we really do here? And once you push that debate away from the illegal immigrant into the police, the efficacy of the police, how do we increase police cooperation, and the infeasibility of a, of a border, which didn't even work, by the way, in East Germany, between Germany and West Germany and the DDR, East Germany, with the military involved, which is far more powerful than the police in most cases. So remember that even patrolling a smaller section of a smaller country's border failed with the military involved. So you're not gonna solve this problem with border control. You can try and you should try, but it shouldn't be something that causes the discussion to eliminate the mirage of diversity and the promise of it. So 
So once you do that, that's how you deal with that. The other thing you have to think about is we're dealing with a long-term situation. I'm obviously in favor of immigration. Uh, you know, I don't want, I wouldn't exist if I lived in a country that looked like a small town in Iowa. I know that. It makes sense to me. That's why I'm, I give these lectures, simply because I have a personal stake in them, even though I don't necessarily believe in that this country's future is going to be a, a good one. Particularly not if, if we don't reverse the discourse or at least get it back on common ground. But because I'm an immigrant and I have a stake in the outcome, these issues are not just logical, but personal. And that's where you can try to address the emotional arguments being made by the other side is that it's absolutely true that it's a tragedy that this person you know, was killed and would not have been killed to the extent that we were able to create for the first time in human history an airtight border. But let's look at the other side of the coin. How many people were killed or, or were murdered in a, you know, within 150 miles of that specific homicide that were killed by a native-born American? And then you start to realize that killing and homicides are unfortunately a fact of American life for many reasons. The availability of illegal guns, which is where you, where you understand the Democrats or the progressives' um, anti-Second Amendment views. You look at, you know, where you can now see where they come from. But like every complex issue, the problem is multifaceted. Within 150 miles of that homicide, how many people were killed by native-born Americans? How many people just died of natural causes? So you, you start to look at these things in a way that makes you realize the complexity of the issue and how no, there's no silver bullet. We're not gonna get there. It's not gonna get there unless you acknowledge the other side has a point. The other side is behaving or thinking, they're well, not behaving logically, they're thinking logically, step by step, right? But once you eliminate the idea of an airtight border over a, in a large country, especially one larger than Germany, you can see that you can't fix this problem to the extent that, social, that you approach it in a way that reduces social cohesion. When I was listening to that debate between Ronald Reagan and the first Bush, um, I felt proud to be an American. And I call myself an Eisenhower Republican and a Jimmy Carter Democrat, in, in part because neither party is capable of making those two men anymore because of the way the discourse has devolved. And when you look at that, you can see the country is on the way up. It's based on the way they're thinking. They're being inclusive, not exclusive. And what George Bush did in that debate was he, he unwittingly quoted Martin Luther King, who came to the same conclusion. King, I believe it was in the speech beyond Vietnam, said, it's the one they don't teach you in school because it's anti-war. We're already in a military industrial complex situation. Uh, if you ever do allocate even more funding towards border control, I can't imagine what would happen at that point. It may be irreversible in terms of ideological uh, division. Martin Luther King said, you cannot, once somebody is in the borders, no, nobody within this country should ever feel like an outsider. Martin Luther King is not a politician. He can make those idealistic broad claims. But listen to it again. No one residing in this country should ever be made to feel like an outsider. It makes you feel good. Even if Martin Luther King didn't say it or somebody else said it, like the first Bush, it makes you feel like there's potential to progress in a way that allows the maximization of talent, even if it's based on an imperfect system or a mirage, which is what diversity in this country has been. That's where we want to go. The way you beat Trump, whom I happen to think is a, is a, as an individual, is probably a wonderful person. You look at his children, you look at his, uh, his wife, who is an immigrant. If you, had to have, if you had to choose between having a dinner, if I had to choose uh, between having dinner with Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, I would pick Donald Trump. He's just, it's just going to be a more interesting conversation. 
The other problem, of course, the Democrats are making it about him, even though they don't really have anybody, anybody as likable or as authentic as Donald Trump. It's another reason they're losing, but that's, that's off course. So the way that you beat that approach is to point out the absurdity and the fact that, that these arguments are made not only on outliers, but without considering the multifaceted components of the issue involved. Because it's not as if we haven't tried to solve illegal immigration. We've been trying to do that for quite some time. If nobody has been able to solve it, it tells you that it's a deeply complex issue that's probably part and parcel of being an empire within a globalized system that values the, the work of the empire's citizens 30, 40, 50 times per hour more than somebody else just based on the accident of birth. And so when you hear people talking about their right to a job because they're a citizen, they're not saying I'm entitled to this job because I was just because I was born here. They're saying that I'm more competent than that guy over there who doesn't love his country as much as I do and who doesn't speak English as much as I do. And this is where it gets off the rails. Who doesn't understand this country as well as, well as I do. Given the poor educational system in this country, you can't make that last statement. Public educational system, as well as in this case, in, in many places, private education systems as well. So you go back and forth and back and forth, but the way that you win is quite frankly just simple. If you love the United States, you have to also acknowledge that we've been able to attract an outsized share of talent from all over the world. Maybe not in politics. Like I said, the best politicians I can remember in my lifetime were two white men, native born Americans. Well, not Eisenhower, obviously wasn't in my lifetime, but um, so the ones I can remember studying and listening to. You look at that debate and you can defeat it with the same idealism that this country had when Ronald Reagan and George Bush were running for election or the primaries and when Martin Luther King was speaking before them. Because the thread that maintains social cohesion is also the thread that acknowledges the humanities linked together, not just today, but throughout history. And any attempt to sever that link will kill us all by reducing social cohesion, by cutting us off from the future, from the best possible future, from the best possible world that we can live in. And the issue is not an outlier. The issue is how do we maximize the potential of everyone in this country while also attracting, while also not cutting us off from talent in other countries? And we know that we benefited from talent from all over the world. You go into any technology company, or heck, even today, uh, you don't have to look at the CEOs of Google and Microsoft and so on. Just go back and look at where your data is stored. Even if you don't believe in diversity, just think about where your data is stored. It's probably stored in a foreign country, which means that we're now linked together in a way that requires us to cooperate to the extent that we're on, we're trying to defend a particular technological standard. But that's getting, again, off course. The idea is that we used to have in this country an intuitive sense of idealism, and we've lost it. And Donald Trump is dangerous, not because he's a bad person. I think he's a good person. Not because he's a liar. I think he's not necessarily so much a liar as much as the fact that he just takes things out of context. We're in this position because we have two political parties, both of whom are corrupt, trying to maintain power in ways that ensures the status quo, whether through gerrymandering or whether through distractions, all of which allows the status quo to fester and reek until the smell and the stench is too much for anyone to bear, except for the ones already in power or connected to the establishment. And you go to a place, this is particularly true when you go to a place, even the place that's been colonized and therefore also suffering from, you know, racial divisions and racial segregation. You go to a place like Singapore or Malaysia 
and you just don't, you have, you get that same sense of intuitive idealism. Because you're, first of all, because they don't have as much money, so they can't have as much debt. They have to, in, in a sense, work together, or at least attempt to work together. There's no other way. So again, it's not idealism that's keeping these people together or that's maintaining social cohesion. In some cases, it's either just poverty or necessity. But again, getting back to the discussion at hand, it's not that hard to beat Donald Trump in a debate. The minute anyone says the word immigration and connects it with a crime, you just have to ask, when have we ever had an airtight border anywhere in human history the size of America's land border with Mexico? Did it happen in Germany? Under a military occupation? If not, what do you think the cost would be to maintain that kind of a system today? Symbol one. Now, having said that, you have to immediately acknowledge the other side and, you know, the other side's concerns. You have to say, that's not arguing with you that a border wall would be ideal if you wanted to eliminate all crime. I'm questioning the fact that you're depending on an individual point, an individual fact, that doesn't also acknowledge the multifaceted factors involved in crime. Because we know that within 150 miles of that victim, who would have been saved by a wall if it was airtight, other people were also killed. And we know that other people are killed in Japan, they're killed with knives, they're killed with sometimes gas. People kill each other, civilians, unfortunately, all too often. And in, in much of those cases, we're dealing with a domestic situation, which tells you that everything is, is fundamentally personal, including crime. So how much of that, how much of that system, or the, how much of that crime that you're citing could be reduced if we were able to balance supply and demand in the labor market? If we were able to trade more equitably with Mexico? If we were able to use international standards to enforce anti-corruption laws all over the world through an independent body that we trusted? How do we honor this, this person's, this victim's memory by pursuing goals that we know we're not going to reach, whether because of financial impossibility or infeasibility? Or just efficacy in general? How do we honor that person's memory? And do we really do it if we don't pursue a path that's both cost-effective and productive and that maintains social cohesion? And I think the way that we should do that, Mr. Trump, or whoever is speaking on behalf of the GOP, I think the way we should do that is by trying to attack at least 10 or 11 of the thousand reasons why crime occurs. And that's going to take cooperation from both you and me. It's going to take much more than just words. It's going to take trust between law enforcement and between the local communities. It's going to require the federal government to respect local control, whether it's a sanctuary city or otherwise, to the extent that local voters prefer that method. It's going to re require a situation where we don't just fund security for the sake of funding it. We try to come up with a set of principles that we can achieve together. And when I mention sanctuary cities, what I'm really talking about is trust in the police. What I'm really talking about is trust in the community and forcing the police and the local voters to work together to come up with a solution that makes sense. What you are saying when you're simply talking about increasing security costs, you're actually going against cooperation. That's, what's, that's what allows you to have the kind of rhetoric that you have. That's very appealing, but only in the short term. Because remember, we are a country that has become great because, in part, of immigration. Because we don't look like a small town in Iowa. As 
lovely as that, town, as that town might have been 75 years ago when Bill Bryson was there, or 70 years ago, or 60 years ago, we would fall behind as human beings within a more globalized world if we still try to maintain that same situation. So now that we know that all empires are going to be diverse and that most empires, if not all, are going to have inequitable wages, particularly for immigrants, whether legal or illegal, what kind of a country do we want to be? Do we want to be the shortest empire in the history of the world? Or do we want to strive for something that maintains social cohesion in a way that tries to maximize human potential and our ability to attract talent from all over the world, particularly now that technology has taken over much of our lives, which requires data to be sent all over the world, which requires now an increasing need for cooperation, not just for security, but also for financial regulation. What you are saying when you focus the issue on immigration without also including its multifaceted issues, factors, when you're focusing the issues on crime without also mentioning the crime is an unfortunate fact of life, particularly in the United States, and we should do everything we can to minimize it, if not prevent it. But we can't get there unless we cooperate with each other. We can't get there if citizens or non-citizens within our communities don't trust the police, because in some cases the police have ceded, have ceded authority to an outside federal department. We have to get to a point where we get along, or at least attempt to get along, so that this image of diversity at some point becomes something more than a mirage. That's really all you have to do. And if we don't, that's all you have to say. It's not that hard. But you know, it's probably easier if you're an immigrant saying these things, right? As opposed to an old white guy. But I get the sense that again, George Bush, the first one, he could have said everything I'm saying. He did. Maybe not in the exact same way. I get the sense Jimmy Carter, well, I know Jimmy Carter could say everything I'm saying and probably better because he's sincere. Eisenhower could say everything I'm saying as well because he's not only sincere, but he cared about people while also being realistic and honest. Certainly not an idealist, I don't think. And yet, I think that man would have been able to say everything I've said here today and probably better because he was sincere. So the problem really isn't politicians themselves or the political system. The problem really is that as voters, we're no longer, we no longer feel in control because we've allowed ourselves to be divided by rhetoric that does nothing more than maintain the status quo. And as George Carlin says about politicians, we can certainly blame them, but in any, in any democratic system, we also have to blame ourselves. How did we get to the point where we now view people in the same community as outsiders? And not only view them as outsiders, but are willing to make them outsiders using, a, using rhetoric. When those outsiders have historically been in a position where they've, most of them have tried to help, even if it's been out of self-interest. In other words, even if their labor has been undervalued in the market, the real issue here has been that we've lost sight of the fact that we're dealing with human beings. And even someone who doesn't speak perfect English today can, within a generation, produce an author, a professor, a machinist, or an engineer that can, at the very minimum, pay taxes, have a family, or just coach a local sports league and therefore contribute in some way that's intangible and not necessarily statistical in any meaningful way as an individual. But together, if you're in a society where we don't take for granted social cohesion, 
we're able to be far more optimistic. And the job of a politician has to be not lying about the facts, not taking facts out of context, but creating a situation where we can all together figure out a way forward that doesn't put us in the same situation as every single empire in the history of the world, which is eventual collapse. Especially when you have another empire, a former one, on the way up. Not just one, by the way, but two. The uh, Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. They've bounced back in just a few decades. Germany, again, bounced back. It took, took a lot longer than the Soviet Union, but they did bounce back. So if they can do it, the question is, are we going to be able to do it as well without suffering either societal collapse or economic collapse? We probably won't suffer economic collapse, but you probably don't want to live in a country that's financially successful while also lacking social cohesion, which robs us of our ability to progress in a way that captures not only the most talent, but also in a way that captures all the information necessary to elevate ourselves, not just intellectually, but in a way that maximizes that feeling we have when someone like Martin Luther King speaks, that feeling of optimism we have when someone like Ronald Reagan and George Bush have a debate that talks about being inclusive. There's that feeling that's also intangible. It's not gonna show up in any, in any statistics, but it's, it's also vital to the extent that you wanna live in a country worth the time.